there's a thermometer hanging next to the social hall entryway. Have you seen it? It reads, this morning, 239,000 $813.82 raised so far. We can give that a round of applause. <laughs> In under two months, our congregation has raised almost half of the $500,000 needed to seal the roof ahead of winter. Wow, that is a remarkable show of generosity, and it is well worth celebrating. And there's still a ways to go. Not only towards this financial goal, but in our wider stewardship. We have work to do as a church in determining the future of our property and our ministry. We have work to do in determining what is sustainable for our church now, for our staff and our congregation and our lay leadership. And in this process, in this work, we have to do, we must all ask ourselves what we are willing and able to give. Now, you might be saying to yourself, uh-oh, is this a fundraising sermon? Don't those usually happen in the fall with the annual stewardship campaign? It's only June. It's early in the year for the pastor to be asking us for money. But before you decide that now is a convenient time for a bathroom break, let me answer the question, is this a fundraising sermon? Not exactly. Pastors, it seems, have been called on to raise money since the beginning of the church. How do I know? Well, that's what Paul is doing in today's passage from 2 Corinthians. He's soliciting donations for the church in Jerusalem from the much wealthier Corinthian congregation. And he utilizes some familiar fundraising tactics. Challenge and compliment. If we back up to just before the start of today's reading, we hear the challenge. Paul compares the Corinthians to the churches in Macedonia, writing, we want you to know about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they voluntarily gave to their means, gave according to their means, begging us, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. In other words, don't let the Macedonian churches show you up. Can you match or even beat their donation? Paul then turns to flattery in verse 7, the beginning of today's section. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you. So we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. You can hear it, right? Corinthians, you are a great church. We 
love you. Your sermons, your intelligence, and your enthusiasm, they are unparalleled. Don't let this be the one area where you fall short. You got to admit, Paul's good. He's pretty good. That's a formula that would work in any pulpit and in any number of fundraising campaigns that I've seen. But it's at this point where Paul's letter and perhaps this sermon turn from fundraising to something more. Follow along with me in verse 8. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. This sounds harsh at first, but Paul is speaking to the real relationship that exists between resources and values. As author Peter Drucker once said, tell me what you value. And I might believe you, but show me your calendar and your bank statement, and I'll show you what you really value. It's not just about what we say we believe, it's about where we put our time and our energy and our money on a daily basis. What would a stranger think if they looked at your Google Calendar, or your Apple Calendar, I don't know which one you use, or your, your planner. What would a stranger think if they got a peek at your checking account? What impression might they form? And how comfortable are you with that impression? Paul is asking the Corinthians and us to do some personal accounting, to be truthful with ourselves about the alignment between our talk and our actions. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Paul makes a critical point here. Generosity goes hand in hand with grace. We miss some of this link with the English translation. But Paul uses the same Greek word to describe both the generous undertaking of raising funds for Jerusalem and the generous act of Jesus. It's the word kairis. Kairis, it shows up throughout the New Testament. And it's actually more often translated as grace. This one word, it encompasses the concepts of grace and generosity, divine favor, loving kindness, joy. You hear it in the word Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the ritual celebration of God's grace that is given to us. Generosity goes hand in hand with grace. Grace flows to us from God, and generosity should flow from us as a response. Paul continues, and in this matter, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. 
Paul is again reminding the Corinthians that their actions should match their words. They expressed eagerness at some point to be involved in the church's work in Jerusalem, and now the time has come to finish the work. How many of us have been there? I'm going to raise my hand because this includes me. We get really excited about an idea or a cause, and then it falls off our radar. We say, oh, we want to get involved, put me on that mailing list, sign me up. But then we sort of backtrack a little bit when the time comes for actual commitment. None of us are perfect, but we are called to a striving for an alignment of actions and values, an alignment that's rooted in God's own generosity and grace. For if the eagerness is there, Paul writes, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. What you have to give is enough. And what you have to give is needed. Let me say that again. What you have to give is enough. And what you have to give is needed. Generosity of resources, both time and money, should not impoverish you. I don't want anyone to think that they must give to a point of financial precarity or to the detriment of their own health or well-being. Take heart and have hope in the knowledge that what you have available to give is enough. Generosity is not about more. It's about balance. A balance between those who have an abundance and those who have a need. And a balance internally. It's that internal accounting. I know they need the money and they got rich people, but um, it's on me. Sorry. One, are we striving for an alignment of our actions and values? Two, are we reflecting God's grace? And three, are we honestly finding a balance between what we need to be well and what we are called to give? This is God's economy. It works differently than our systems of economy. We see it in the story of Exodus, in which God provides for the Israelites in the wilderness. Bread from heaven covers the ground in the morning, and the people are instructed to gather it according to their need. Now, because humans will be humans, some of the Israelites take a little more than they need. And some, for whatever reason, take a little less. But this miraculous thing happens when they go to measure it. No matter how much they actually picked up from the ground, no one has too much. And no one has too little. Isn't that incredible? 
Wouldn't that be something if that's how our economies worked? As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. There is enough for everyone if we let there be enough for everyone. That's the truth. There is enough for everyone if we let there be enough for everyone. God created a beautiful world with enough resources for all beings. And in God's economy, those resources are shared reciprocally among people and communities. But too often as humans, we create our own economies of scarcity, our own systems that disenfranchise the majority in favor of the few, ungenerous systems that ultimately harm everyone, regardless of the position one has within that system. These systems, they harm us, all of us, because they disconnect us from one another, from creation and from the creator. So you see, in the end, it's not simply about fundraising for Paul or for me. It's about a generosity that allows us to participate in the economy of God's grace. Because here's the amazing thing. Grace is not just a one-way gift or a one-time transaction. It's something that is ongoing and that we get to be a part of of. Each one of us with our unique gifts and talents, our unique availability and ability, and yes, our unique financial resources, has the chance to participate in grace, to be a part of God's economy, a system that instead of separating us, gives us connection and meaning and balance. There are innumerable ways to participate in God's grace. Through friendships, relationships, marriages, through being in touch with creation, gardening, swimming in the lake, through parenting, through playing, through the work we do, our occupations, through working for justice. But one way is through the church. The church, even with all of its flaws and failings, is a way that God works in the world. So let me take a moment and speak specifically to those of you who have chosen to participate in this church, Hyde Park Union Church. We need you. Not just your money, we need you. You exactly as you are. Hyde Park Union Church needs your thoughts, your dreams, the things that only you can bring to this reciprocal, interconnected, tangled up, beautiful space. After worship today, we have our annual program meeting where we vote on officers and we reflect on the past year of church life and preview what comes next. Hyde Park Union Church turns 150 in the fall. I'm going to say it one more time. Wow. 150 years. 150 years of life together and ministry. That's incredible. And we need to decide what comes next. Part of that is a roof repair. 
But the rest of it, well, that depends on you. Amen. Amen.